Welcome to The War from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Among the many sad facts of history is this. With everything that Franklin Delano Roosevelt did to ensure uh, the U.S. victory in World War II, he died without seeing that victory achieved. He passed away... uh, less than a month before VE Day and four months before uh, VJ Day. The domestic policies of President Roosevelt certainly remain a topic for debate that in many ways defines much of our political discourse. Yet many who don't fully embrace everything that his domestic politics stood for will salute the pure brilliance of the way that he prosecuted the war. There are certain aspects of this that are somewhat controversial, such as the internment of Japanese Americans. But there were so many critical decisions and policies enacted by President Roosevelt, and so many ways that uniquely he contributed to U.S. victory. And so his untimely death was greeted with great sadness. And so we'll play you uh, a little bit of the coverage of that death from CBS News. From April 12th of 1945, Don Fisher reports from Warm Springs. This is Don Fisher speaking to you again from Warm Springs, Georgia. This small southern community, which has been linked often with the name of the late President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, is wrapped tonight in the deepest shrouds of mourning. News of the humanitarian president's passing, which came so suddenly here this afternoon has brought sincere grief to the hearts of these Georgians who had come to know him so well in his visits here during his tenure of the presidency. Here tonight is Mr. Fred Botts, registrar of the Warm Springs Foundation, a long acquaintance of Mr. Roosevelt's, who will express the feelings of those here in Warm Springs. Mr. Botts. We, the patients, were inexpressibly shocked when hearing of our great leader's passing. Words are so futile at a time like this that we can only bow our heads, mingling our grief with the rest of the nation. Yet, we know it was and is his wish that we carry on and forward the great work he started here. He will still be our great inspiration. His spirit will live in our hearts always, as he did yesterday and the day before when he moved in our midst, guiding, directing, and cheerfully urging us on to overcome our infantile paralysis handicaps. We will prove our worth as his memory keeps company with our hearts, hearts now wounded, but tomorrow strong in the faith to achieve the goal he set for us. Thank you very much, Mr. Botts. Among the members of the press who were in Warm Springs today were the representatives of the three great wire services of America, Mr. Merriman Smith of the United Press, Mr. Harold Oliver of the Associated Press, and Mr. Robert Nixon of the International News Service. First, I'll call Mr. Merriman Smith over to the microphone. Mr. Smith is a past president of the White House Correspondents Association. Merriman, tell us about the occasion of the planned barbecue over at Mayor Algorn's place this afternoon. This was to have been a very happy day in the life of the president. He likes to be out with people... He likes to see new things. And this afternoon on a small mountain just outside of Warm Springs, the mayor, Frank Alcorn, had a marvelous barbecue arranged. There were country fiddlers and there were pigs and lambs roasting over an open pit, big stew pot full of Brunswick stew. The president was supposed to be there at 4.30. Everybody was up there, the citizens of Warm Springs, few that knew about it, who up there in their Sunday best, some members of the president's party were there too, waiting around. The president was supposed to arrive at 4.30, and about that time, the party hadn't shown up, so we telephoned to the uh, little White House switchboard and got a hurry call to get right over there, and then's when the world first knew the news that Franklin D. Roosevelt had died. Well, Merriman, uh, tell us this. The reading public in America and the listening public have heard a great deal about the 
news and radio conferences at the White House, and the president has always been described as being a very affable person at those conferences. It is true, isn't it, that he uh, not only had a great deal of fun with the members of the press as they attended those conferences, but they rather looked forward to them themselves, didn't they? As a matter of practical fact, Don, he was God's gift to newspaper men. He produced more copy over the period of years that he was in the White House than any president in history. Well, thank you very much, Merriman. Now here's Mr. Harold Oliver of the Associated Press. Harold, how many campaigns have you covered with the president? Well, I, I covered his whole second campaign beginning in 1936 and part of his subsequent third and fourth campaigns. And, uh, of course, you got to know the president rather well, I imagine, in that space of time. What are, uh, briefly, some of the highlights, some of the things that stand out in your mind as you covered those campaigns in 36 and 40 and now the most recent one in 44? Well, the things that stood out in my mind more in the campaign travel was the the hard trial uh, on the physiques of those trying to keep up with the fast pace the president set. Especially, that is true, of the press service men who had to write 24 hours around the clock. Well, uh, there was uh, quite a bit of mention last fall, if you remember, when he would get out in that open car on those cold days and ride through the city streets of uh, Boston and New York to uh, more or less enjoy seeing all the people along the parade route and have them enjoy seeing him too. Isn't that right? That is true, Don. Well, uh, what are the funeral plans as of right now, Harold? The funeral plans, uh, as we know them here, are very tentative and incomplete. Uh, however, we believe they have been announced in Washington, but so far as we know, they plan to take the body from here sometime tomorrow morning, probably beginning around 8 o'clock Central Time, which mm -hmm. is on Warm Springs time. And then they'll uh, proceed on to proceed Washington. Proceed to Washington. Uh, it takes about 22 hours to get to Washington. Well, thank you very much, Harold. I know that you, like all other newspaper and radio men, are rather sorry that this uh, series of trips to Warm Springs seems to be nearing an end because it's been a great pleasure to come down here to Warm Springs, not only to be in the president's party, but to mingle with the townspeople here. Certainly. Now here's Bob Nixon of the International News Service. Bob, tell me, uh, how has the president looked to you on this particular trip to Warm Springs? Well, I'd, I'd rather preface it by saying this about Franklin Roosevelt. During the past 12 years, he has been called upon to bear burdens that perhaps no other man in history has ever had to bear. He bore up under them like perhaps no other man could, could bear. During the past year, he's failed rapidly. Coming down here from Washington on this trip, the president looked a little tired and worn. Perhaps no more so than he has for many months past. He had just come back, as you know, from the great conference at Yalta. He looked fine when he got back. He had had two weeks of beautiful sunshine on his voyage back home. And it's, rem it's remarkable the, the uh, recuperative powers that the president did have. At one time, he would look tired and worn then a few days of sunshine and rest, and he would look in great shape again. The past week or so, after his arrival here, he got out in the sun a great deal, and while he was, he was thin and tired looking, his death today came very unexpectedly and a great shock to all. I understand he used to get a great kick out of uh, coming down to Warm Springs and after uh, getting out of his railroad car, getting into his automobile and driving it on up to the foundation. Did he do that this trip? He was a man who loved to do things and l liked to do them himself. On this particular trip, mainly he drove around in, in an open car with his chauffeur. What, uh, what were his plans as to the uh, San Francisco conference? I know he looked forward to going out there to officially open the conference. What were his plans, do you know? Was he going on to, uh, from Washington to San Francisco? Yes, Don. One of the uh, last things he did today before he died was to dictate the itinerary for his trip out to San Francisco. We were to leave here next week, stopping briefly in Washington, 
and then continuing on out to San Francisco, where he was to address the United Nations Conference as the host. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Ladies and gentlemen, we've presented Mr. Fred Botts, Registrar of the Warm Springs Foundation, a long acquaintance of President Roosevelt's. We've also presented members of the three wire services, Mr. Merriman Smith of United Press, Mr. Bob Nixon of International News Service, and Mr. Mr. Howard uh, Oliver, Mr. Harold Oliver, rather, of the Associated Press. Thank you very much, gentlemen, all of you, for coming down to the microphone tonight to give the American listening public an inside view of just how things have been in Warm Springs today. This is Don Fisher speaking now, and I return you to New York. Robert Trout of CBS World News has spent many hours traveling with President Roosevelt during his long tenure in the White House. He has had opportunities unlike many others to see the president under various circumstances. Mr. Trout. Tonight, the tributes are beginning to come in from the great and the small of the civilized world. There will be many sincere words of sorrow and respect, and there will be many tears, and most of them will come from the small, the unknown people, because, as another American wartime president, who also died before his task was done, once observed, there are so many more of the common people. Tonight, as the tributes and the recollections come in, it might not be out of place for me to add a few of my own recollections. Because I am a broadcaster, my memories of Franklin Roosevelt are almost exclusive, exclusively concerned with the business of broadcasting. The president was known as an exceptionally able broadcaster. Many pages of prose were written, analyzing his microphone style and technique, and students of politics have frequently attempted to evaluate the effect of Mr. Roosevelt's broadcasting talents on his political fortunes. But those whose business is not with broadcasting are not likely to remember that Franklin Roosevelt created much broadcasting history. He was the first world statesman to use the radio as a vital instrument of social power. He used it in a personalized fashion. His most famous talks were delivered in the style of an intimate conversation, which was enormously effective. He saw clearly the power of radio before many men in government had seen it. When Franklin Roosevelt was sworn in as President of the United States for the first time, it was not the fashion of world statesmen to take their problems to the people simply and directly by speaking to the people, millions of them at once, over the radio. In these few short years, it has now become so much the fashion that it's taken for granted and scarcely remarked upon. For now it is the custom for the heads of the greatest nations to make their most important pronouncements to all the world at once by radio. The day after Franklin Roosevelt's first inauguration, on Sunday, the 5th of March, 1933, he broadcast his first fireside chat. Tomorrow, the 13th of April, 1945, he was scheduled to broadcast from Warm Springs. At that first fireside chat, and at many of the presidential broadcasts that followed, I had the opportunity of being with the president. As a representative of the Columbia Broadcasting System, I introduced a large number of the White House broadcasts and traveled with the presidential party through most of the states of the Union to handle the broadcasts outside the White House. From the beginning, it was plain that Franklin Roosevelt understood radio. He was interested in the technical equipment and in the intricate arrangements often necessary when he addressed the nation from remote places such as a lodge high in the Rocky Mountains, or the parapet of a newly completed dam, or from his car of the presidential train. After he'd been in office only a few months, other statesmen, other men in politics, in foreign countries as well as the United States, showed that they were learning the lesson that radio is the natural method for a statesman to use in communicating directly with the people. President Roosevelt's approach to the microphone was extremely natural, although he had different styles which he used when speaking from his desk or when addressing the radio audience over the heads of a great visible audience in an auditorium or a stadium. I've seen him take the microphone at a college gathering, intending to speak a sentence or two of thanks for an honorary degree, and then suddenly seized with inspiration, deliver an extemporaneous address lasting half an hour. And I've seen him, upon arriving too early at a political rally, stand patiently at the rostrum for 45 minutes before beginning his speech until the scheduled time for the broadcast to start. And it was not easy for Franklin Roosevelt to stand. Once, as I was describing to Columbia's radio audience, the approach of the president up the ramp to the speaker's platform at one of the largest political rallies of all, 
the braces on his legs gave way, and he fell. The pages of his manuscript were scattered. They were picked up by willing hands and hurriedly handed back to the president, who by that time had been seated, now within view of the visible audience of many thousands. He put the pages together again as best he could in the few moments before he was introduced. The manuscript was damp, crumpled, and spattered with mud. It was a tense moment, and Mr. Roosevelt did not falter. Only a handful of the thousands in the stadium that night had the faintest idea that anything at all had gone wrong. That was the night the president, in a strong and confident voice, proclaimed, This generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. Many will remember that broadcast speech, delivered at Franklin Field in Philadelphia at the end of the Democratic Convention of 1936. It was the president's acceptance speech for a second term nomination. And if he had allowed the accident to upset him, if he had become unnerved by the prospect that the braces might fail again while he was speaking, the political history of this nation might have been changed. He was not unnerved. If Franklin Roosevelt ever was, those of us who form the body of journalists, of radio and press, who have covered his activities, have not been aware of it. Customarily, his hand shook as he stood before the crowds so often in so many cities and villages, but there was no tremor in his voice. It was calm and confident by nature. It was calm that very first day on March the 4th, 1933, when, a few minutes after he became president of the United States, he told the millions waiting by their radios so anxiously, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. It was strange for me to enter the White House the next night, that memorable Sunday, when the new president was to broadcast the proclamation closing the nation's banks. The first move in the hurried, exciting days that followed as the new government led the country in the struggle against the worst of all economic depressions. On that Sunday night, the White House corridor is still cluttered with hedge and packing cases. The first family of the land had not yet had time to unpack and move in. Later... A more or less permanent broadcasting studio was created in a small oval-shaped room on the ground floor of the White House, the diplomatic reception room. But on this first night, the microphones were set up in the Lincoln study, a room which still clings to memories of the president who died before another war was won. Before broadcast time, Franklin Roosevelt sat calmly on a sofa talking to his old friend and advisor, Louis McHenry Howe, now dead. Earlier... There had been a business conference in the offices of Columbia's Washington Station. And as a result of that meeting, Stephen Early, the president's secretary, was asked by telephone what he thought of a title Columbia had thought of for the president's talk. The suggested title was Fireside Chat. A bit later, Mr. Early telephoned back that the president thought the title was grand. It expressed just the kind of talk he intended to make. But there in the Lincoln study... A few minutes before the clock showed it was time for me to introduce to America for the first time the now famous phrase, fireside chat, a few minutes before airtime, it was discovered that the manuscript for the first fireside chat was missing. A search was made for the missing speech amidst great excitement, but one man was not touched by the excitement, Mr. Roosevelt. He was unperturbed and seemed perfectly satisfied when someone found a mimeographed press copy of the speech. It was not so easy a copy to read, especially to so large an audience at a time so tense. But the president used that copy when he spoke. His cigarette in the long ivory holder burned down nearly to the end as he talked on the air. I watched it in strained fascination, for in those days in Washington, radio reporters were not used to statesmen who felt so thoroughly at home before a microphone that they could stamp out a cigarette in an ashtray while broadcasting without pausing or stumbling. Later, of course, we grew used to the president's ease of manner, and it was no surprise one summer night in the White House when Mr. Roosevelt's throat became dry as he spoke to hear him casually interrupt his broadcast to ask for a glass of water, and after he had sipped it, say to the nationwide audience, it's a hot night in Washington, my friends. Another night, the president exceeded his scheduled time on the air and a clock on the mantel loudly chimed ten, which might have upset a broadcaster with less poise. But Franklin Roosevelt was not upset during that broadcast or any of the others when unplanned incidents occurred, such as on the night when his son James stepped without looking and fell over the president's wheelchair with a loud crash, 
just as I'd finished the introduction and Mr. Roosevelt started to speak. Radio reporters, like me, were used to hearing the president call us by our first names and make little jokes at our expense. He loved to tease us about the speeches, as he would call them, speeches we were sometimes forced to make when for some reason there was more time on the air than had been scheduled to fill with words before the president began. And he often joked about the fireside checks on hot summer nights in Washington when a refrigerator would have been more comfortable than a fire. There were many strange and often moving sights to be seen on the presidential trips across the country year after year. From the beginning, the people came to see and to listen. When he could, the president spoke to them from the rear platform of his railroad car, which was equipped with a microphone. The baggage car of the presidential train carried the complicated microphone stand, which Columbia presented to Mr. Roosevelt on his first inauguration day, and which was used in the formal addresses at stops along the way. Often in the middle of the night, speeding through open farm country, or perhaps through the desert, some of the reporters aboard the train who had stayed up late would look out the window, and there, almost always, over the miles and through the days, were the silent crowds, farmers, shopkeepers, miners, fishermen, factory workers, desert rats. They rode in their battered cars or drove their horses or walked, for no one knows how many hours, to stand beside the tracks in the middle of the dark night and watch the president's train speed by. It seemed to satisfy them, as nearly as we could ever tell, just to stand there and look, or perhaps wave a handkerchief or a hat. Once in the rugged country of Idaho, we'd roared along in the train for many miles without seeing a house or a man. Suddenly, the train raced out from between the tall trees and ran beside a quiet mountain lake. There, on a tiny homemade pier beside his log cabin, stood a man, a trapper or a fisherman or a hunter, perhaps, standing on his little pier between two large American flags he'd rigged up, standing at attention with his hand in a military salute at his forehead, as the train sped past. He'd made his arrangements, put up his decorations, and he greeted the train for the few moments it was visible to him. Millions of people all over the world will remember Franklin Roosevelt in some particular attitude or pose. Millions who've never seen him will keep in their minds the memory of his smile, perhaps, or his cheerful radio greeting, my friend. Naturally, my own memory picture will be one in which Franklin Roosevelt was doing what I've seen him do so often, speaking into a microphone to all the people of this country and to all men of goodwill everywhere. There are many such mental pictures that come to me tonight. Perhaps it's not possible to choose deliberately the one I should prefer to remember. But if I am allowed a choice, I should like to remember always the Capitol steps in Washington crowded with those who were tormented by worry and the new president of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, saying to those people and to the millions beyond the Capitol at home by their radios, saying, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Welcome back. At the same time that Americans were dealing with the death of President Roosevelt, they were also facing the true magnitude of the horrors of Nazi Germany and at the same time found a key reminder of the great difference that President uh, Roosevelt's life and his service during uh, World War II made an impact on the world. And this report from Edward R. Murrow from April 15, 1945, may be somewhat disturbing. Certainly there have been more graphic portrayals of what happened at the concentration camps. But still, listener discretion is advised. Here now is Edward R. Murrow reporting. Permit me to tell you what you would have seen and heard had you been with me on Thursday. It will not be pleasant listening. If you're at lunch, or if you have no appetite to hear what Germans have done, now is a good time to switch off the radio. For I propose to tell you of Buchenwald. It is on a small hill about four miles outside Weimar, and it was one of the largest concentration camps in Germany, and it was built to last. As we approached it, we saw about a hundred men in civilian clothes, with rifles, advancing in open order across the field. There were a few shots. We stopped to inquire. 
were told that some of the prisoners had a couple of SS men cornered in there. We drove on, reached the main gate. The prisoners crowded up behind the wire. We entered. And now let me tell this in the first person, for I was the least important person there, as you shall hear. There surged around me an evil-smelling horde. Men and boys reached out to touch me. They were in rags and the remnants of uniforms. Death had already marked many of them, but they were smiling with their eyes. I looked out over that mass of men to the green fields beyond, where well-fed Germans were plowing. A German, Fritz Kirchheimer, came up and said, May I show you around the camp? I've been here ten years. An Englishman stood to attention, saying, May I introduce myself? Delighted to see you. And can you tell me when some of our blokes will be along? I told him soon, and asked to see one of the barracks. It happened to be occupied by Czechoslovakian. When I entered, men crowded around, tried to lift me to their shoulders. They were too weak. Many of them could not get out of bed. I was told that this building had once stabled 80 horses. There were 1,200 men in it, fired to a bunk. The stink was beyond all description. When I reached the center of the barracks, a man came up and said, you remember me. I am Peter Zenko, one-time mayor of Prague. I remembered him, but did not recognize him. He asked about Danish and Jan Matrix. I asked how many men had died in that building during the last month. They called the doctor. We inspected his records. There were only names in the little black book, nothing more. Nothing who these men were, what they had done, or hoped. Behind the names of those who had died, there was a cross. I counted them. They totaled 242. 242 out of 1,200 in one month. As I walked down to the end of the barracks, there was applause from the men too weak to get out of bed. It sounded like the hand clapping of babies. They were so weak. The doctor's name was Paul Heller. He had been there since 38. As we walked out into the courtyard, a man fell dead. Two others, they must have been over 60, were crawling towards the latrine. I saw it, but will not describe it. In another part of the camp, they showed me the children, hundreds of them. Some were only six. One rolled up his sleeve, showed me his number. It was tattooed on his arm. D-6030 it was. The others showed me their numbers. They will carry them till they die. An elderly man standing beside me said, The children, enemies of the state. I could see their ribs through their thin shirts. The old man said, I am Professor Charles Grisha of the Sorbonne. The children clung to my hands and stared. We crossed to the courtyard. Men kept coming up to speak to me and to touch me. Professors from Poland, doctors from Vienna, men from all Europe. Men from the countries that made America. We went to the hospital. It was full. The doctor told me that 200 had died the day before. I asked the cause of death. He shrugged and said, Tuberculosis, starvation, fatigue, and there are many who have no desire to live. It is very difficult. Dr. Heller pulled back the blankets from a man's feet to show me how swollen they were. The man was dead. Most of the patients could not move. As we left the hospital, I drew out a leather billfold, hoping that I had some money which would help those who lived to get home. Professor Richer from the Sorbonne said, I should be careful of my wallet if I were you. You know, there are criminals in this camp, too. A small man tottered up, saying, May I feel the leather, please? You see, I used to make good things of leather in Vienna. Another man said, my name is Walter Röder. For many years, I lived in Joliet. Came back to Germany for a visit, and Hitler grabbed me. I asked to see the kitchen. It was clean. The German in charge had been a communist. Had been at Buchenwald for nine years. Had a picture of his daughter in Hamburg. Hadn't seen her for almost 12 years. And if I got to Hamburg, would I look her up? He showed me the daily ration. One piece of brown bread about as thick as your thumb. On top of it, a piece of margarine, as big as three sticks of chewing gum. That and a little stew 
with what they received every 24 hours. He had a chart on the wall, very complicated it was. There were little red tabs scattered through it. He said that was to indicate each ten men who died. He had to account for the rations. And he added, We're very efficient here. We went again into the courtyard. And as we walked, we talked. The two doctors, the Frenchman and the Czech, agreed that about 6,000 had died during March. Kirschenheimer, the German, added that back in the winter of 39, when the Poles began to arrive, without winter clothing, they died at the rate of approximately 900 a day. Five different men asserted that Buchenwald was the best concentration camp in Germany. They had had some experience of the others. Dr. Heller, the Czech, asked if I would care to see the crematorium. He said it wouldn't be very interesting because the Germans had run out of coke some days ago and had taken to dumping the bodies into a great hole nearby. Professor Riesier said, perhaps I would care to see the small courtyard. I said, yes. He turned and told the children to stay behind. As we walked across the square, I noticed that the professor had a hole in his left shoe and a toe sticking out of the right one. He followed my eyes and said, I regret that I am so little presentable, but what can one do? At that point, another Frenchman came up to announce that three of his fellow countrymen outside had killed three SS men and taken one prisoner. We proceeded to the small courtyard. The wall was about eight feet high. It adjoined what had been a stable or garage. We entered. It was floored with concrete. There were two rows of bodies stacked up like cordwood. They were thin and very white. Some of the bodies were terribly bruised, though there seemed to be little flesh to bruise. Some had been shot through the head, but they bled but little. All except two were naked. I tried to count them as best I could, and arrived at the conclusion that all that was mortal of more than 500 men and boys lay there in two neat piles. There was a German trailer, which must have contained another 50, but it wasn't possible to count them. The clothing was piled in a heap against the wall. It appeared that most of the men and boys had died of starvation. They had not been executed. But the manner of death seemed unimportant. Murder had been done at Pugenwald. God alone knows how many men and boys have died there during the last 12 years. Thursday, I was told that there were more than 20,000 in the camp. There had been as many as 60,000. Where are they now? As I left that camp, a Frenchman who used to work for Havas in Paris came up to me and said, You will write something about this, perhaps. And he added, To write about this, you must have been here at least two years. And after that, you don't want to write anymore. I pray you to believe what I have said about Buchenwald. I have reported what I saw and heard, but only part of it. For most of it, I have no words. Dead men are plentiful in war, but the living dead, more than 20,000 of them in one camp. And the country round about was pleasing to the eye, and the Germans were well-fed and well-dressed. American trucks were rolling towards the rear, filled with prisoners. Soon they would be eating American rations, as much for a meal as the men at Buchenwald received in four days. If I have offended you by this rather mild account of Buchenwald, I am not in the least sorry. I was there on Thursday, and many men in many tongues blessed the name of Roosevelt. For long years, his name had meant the full measure of their hope. These men, who had kept close company with death for many years, did not know that Mr. Roosevelt would, within hours, join their comrades who had laid their lives on the scales of freedom. Back in 41, Mr. Churchill said to me, with tears in his eyes, One day the world and history will recognize and acknowledge what it owes to your president. I saw and heard the first installment of that at Buchenwald on Thursday. It came from men from all over Europe. Their faces, with more flesh on them, might have been found anywhere at home. To them, the name Roosevelt was a symbol, the code word for a lot of guys named Joe, who were somewhere out in the blue, with the armor, heading east. At Buchenwald, they spoke of the president just before he died. If there be a better epitaph, 
history does not record it. That will do it for today. If you uh, have a comment, email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. I welcome your story or that of loved ones who served during World War II. Ken Curlin provides our opening theme music, kencurlin.com. I am your host, Adam Graham. This uh, series is provided as a service of the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio, greatdetectives.net.